Korean War veterans in New Zealand made into documentary. Ongoing support for Holocaust survivors in Israel. Korean community in the Philippines gathers to prevent crimes. Conductor Kim Bo Mi of the Vienna Boys Choir. Korean baristas shine on the world stage. Hello, welcome to Going Global. I'm your host, Chung Se Mi. One of the Korean dishes that's popular around the world is bibimbap. A renowned culinary college in the United States recently held a cooking competition called Show Me Your Bibimbap. With a limited budget of about $50 for each team, students created their own unique bibimbap. The first prize went to a team that made bibimbap with pork cooked in southern U.S. style. And their recipe will be put on the menu at a popular Korean restaurant in New York for one month. It's great to see how bibimbap is being enjoyed more and more around the world as a signature Korean dish. And hopefully, it'll pave the way for other Korean dishes as well. Now here's our first story of the day. This year marks the 65th anniversary of the outbreak of the Korean War. Among the soldiers who participate in the war, nearly 6,000 of them were from New Zealand. And for the very first time, a documentary is being made about these Korean War veterans in New Zealand. Let's go behind the scenes. An old man sits in front of the camera. His name is Morrison Garson, who served as a gunner in the Korean War when he was 21 years old. His vivid memories of the war are recorded just as they are. Uh, we had summer white sleeping bags um, and a couple of blankets and uh, the cold took its toll and that was, that was one of our first. New Zealand-based film director David Blythe started working on a documentary about Korean War veterans last year. He is well known for making feature films, but he was inspired by his grandfather who served in the First World War to create documentaries about war veterans. My own grandfather, who was uh, a veteran from the First World War, and I interviewed him when he was 97 years old, that inspired me to do the same for the World War II Korea and Vietnam veterans to give them a voice. Blythe is planning to interview 30 people for his documentary, including 10 Korean War veterans. He finished about half of the interviews so far and will get the rest done within this year. Because these men, they won't live forever and it's important, the small details that, that come across through the interviews. Blythe's documentary has faced some financial difficulties because it's not a commercial film. But he's coming together with his co-producer Patricia to support the production and the families of the war veterans are helping out with collecting materials. We're hoping that the Korean part of where our soldiers were involved and our sailors, that that will come out because a lot of people don't even know that they were in Korea and they did a lot of good work there, a lot of hard work. Blythe hopes that his documentary could inspire others to record the stories of the war veterans in other parts of the world. He plans to release the documentary online for free. The Korean War is still remembered as a tragic history to many, especially the veterans. Let's hope the documentary produced by director Blythe will help future generations learn from and understand more about the Korean War. Hopefully the film can be introduced here in Korea as well. Now let's move on to our next story. The tragic sinking of the Seolho Ferry in Korea last year brought the importance of proper trauma treatment to light. In Israel, a country that witnessed the massacre of Jews more than 70 years ago, constant trauma treatment is being provided for not only the survivors, but also their children and grandchildren. What kind of efforts are being made to treat the Holocaust victims and their families? Let's take a look. Elderly people who depend on wheelchairs or other mobility aids have gathered at this cultural center. 
It's the day when the center's flower arrangement class takes place. Colorful flowers put a bright smile on their faces. They each make their own beautiful flower arrangements. This is a cultural program for Holocaust survivors, the Jews who were sent to Nazi concentration camps during the Second World War and survived. They come here once a week to do cultural activities, such as drawing and making pottery. The Israeli government supports these art therapy programs. This is where 82-year-old Jenny Izegovich lives. Jenny and her husband were sent to a concentration camp in Transnistria near Ukraine in 1941. More than 70 years have passed after the camp was liberated, but the Holocaust is still a vivid memory for them. A care worker supported by the government visits Jenny's home frequently to check her health and other inconveniences. But there's a place that she visits three times a week for her trauma treatment. It's a psychotherapy center located half an hour away from her house. Here she opens up about her painful past memories. The survivors overcome their trauma by talking about their pain to the therapist. The free psychotherapy sessions are provided not only for Holocaust survivors, but also for their children and grandchildren. It's because just by listening to the vivid stories of the past, the children could suffer from secondary trauma. בדור שני ושלישי של ניצולי שואה. אדם שנמצא פה, בני המשפחה הם חלק מהטיפול שלה. There are 15 centers in Israel that specialize in trauma treatment of Holocaust survivors through art activities and counseling. Although time passes and generations change, treating the wounds must go on. This is what Israel is doing and showing to the world. Now here's our next story. The Philippines welcomes more than one million tourists every year. It's also a country where about 100,000 Koreans live in. However, for the past few years, the number of violent crimes targeting Koreans has been rising. And to prevent further crimes, the Korean community came together with the Philippine police and built a police outpost in Manila. Let's take a look. Inside a Korean restaurant in the Philippines, a young couple is having a conversation without ordering any food. A few moments later, the couple swiftly runs out of the restaurant. The restaurant owner and a private security guard are immediately after them. Three people who went around Korean restaurants for stealing last April were finally caught by the cooperation between the Korean community and the local police. The achievement came three weeks after a Korean police outpost in Manila opened. The Malate district in the city of Manila has a Korea town where more than 70 Korean businesses, including restaurants and travel agencies, are concentrated. It's become a dangerous district where crimes like burglary and robbery often occur under the perception that Koreans have a lot of cash. However, two years ago, the crimes became more violent, with some that led to murder urgent solutions were needed. And these outposts uh, serves to decrease the crime incidents in the religious area circle we're in before. We have uh, an increase of crime incidents because this area is quite dim, uh, quite dark. <laughs> The 
The Korean Embassy and the Korean community in the Philippines invested about 8.6 million won to build the Korean police outpost. With the help of the Manila Police District, eight armed policemen work double shifts to go on patrol with Korean officials. The Korean community in the Philippines is planning to install two or three more police outposts in the future to ensure the safety of Koreans living near the crime-ridden district. Now moving on to our next story. The Vienna Boys Choir is famous for the angelic voices. In its 520-year history, the choir appointed its first ever female conductor from Korea for one of its boys' choirs. Let's meet Kim Bo Mi and the stories of her dream and passion. Cheerful, energetic voices of boys. They are the Vienna Boys Choir, famous for their angelic voices. The one who's playing the piano is Kim Bo Mi from Korea. She was appointed as the choir master three years ago. Kimbo Mi became the first ever female conductor in the 520 year history of Vienna Boys Choir. Her professor and advisor, who once worked as conductor of the choir, recommended her for an audition. At the audition, she was rated the highest by the music director. It was unprecedented for the conservative Austrian musical circle to select a female, moreover an Asian, as the choir master. The Vienna Boys Choir is divided into four groups, named after Austrian composers Mozart, Schubert, Haydn and Bruckner. Kim conducts the Mozart Choir, which consists of 26 boys. Ten of the boys are from outside of Austria, and one of them is a Korean. It's better for us because she has a <coughs> soprano voice, which we also sing. So it's, she, she can teach us better than, I think she teaches better than other, other choir masters. Kim is now a successful composer, but her journey to become a musician was far from easy. She'd wanted to do music since she was young, but faced with her parents' disapproval, she once studied hotel management at university. She came a long way to be where she is now. That's why she has a different attitude toward her career. As a teacher, Kim's foremost concern is not to let the boys lose passion for music. She knows from experience that even with talent, once you lose your passion, it's hard to carry on down that path. Now here's our last story of the day. At this year's National Barista Competition in Australia, there were two winners from Korea each winning in a different category. They recently went on to represent Australia at the World Coffee event held in Sweden from June 16th to the 18th. Let's meet these two passionate baristas. From a zebra having a cup of coffee to a peacock flashing its feathers. A cup of coffee is reborn as a piece of art. Beautiful, and then you can test it. So it's nice stuck together. The creator of this beautiful latte art is Cha Sung Won, or Caleb Cha, a Korean barista in Australia. To create special latte art different from other baristas, he practiced his drawing on more than 700 different coffees a day. His hard work has paid off. He came in second at the Australian Latte Art Championship last year, and this year he won. He was then given the honor to represent Australia at the World Coffee event held on June 16th in Sweden. 남들과 똑같아서는 안 된다고 생각하거든요. 
조금 더 머리를 쓰고 창의적이고 뭔가를 더 개발하는 그런 노력을 보여주는 것이 어떤 선수로서의 예의가 아닐까 이런 생각을 계속 하게 됐어요. This is another Korean barista in Australia, Ko Hyun Suk or Harry Ko, who also participated in the World Coffee event this year. He participated in the same competition as Cha in March last year and won first place in the World Cup Tasters competition. Ko had to distinguish the difference between eight sets of coffee and identify the one selected by the host. He got all eight answers correct. It was a result of his self-taught, diligent practice of three to four hours a day after work. 호주의 대표로 나갈 수 있다는 것 자체도 되게 크나큰 영광이고 그리고 어, 어, 다른 이제 선수들을 대신해서 대표해서 나가는 만큼 더 열심히 해야겠죠. Cha and Ko both came to Australia through the Working Holiday Program. After working at a cafe, they dreamed of becoming professional baristas. The two Koreans have now proven the high caliber of their ability at the World Class Championships, where baristas from 70 countries gathered to compete. I hope you enjoy the stories we shared today on Going Global. A children's book publisher in Argentina called Pequeño Editor has published the world's first book, which, once it is read, can be buried in the ground and will grow into a tree. The picture book is handmade from acid-free paper and silk and environment-friendly inks. Once it's printed, seeds of jacaranda are hand-stitched into its pages, and it's definitely a book that I personally would like to have. For children who own the book, bearing the book after reading it and then waiting for it to grow into a tree will be almost a magical experience. Now, Going Global will be back next week with more fascinating and exciting stories. Thank you for watching.